So let's talk about the AI management system or the AIMS. And the spirit of any management system in an ISO framework is that the management system is how you govern the framework and what you're trying to implement. So in this case, it's establishing kind of a governance structure to manage risk related to artificial intelligence. That is similar and conceptually to any ISO framework that you ever implement. So if you're already familiar with ISO 27001 or ISO 27701 or ISO 9001, any, any ISO framework, they're all going to have this concept of a management system. And you can just think of that as this management system is establishing the governance structure to manage the thing I'm trying to get certified. All ISO frameworks are going to have that. You'll also hear it called clauses 4 through 10. So you'll hear in ISO 27001, there's a clause 4 through 10 and, and so on and so forth. So just know that that's the spirit of a management system. A management system also it has to be documented. So when you go to achieve certification and you download this framework and you see that there's 15 pages of management system, you have to really think through how do you apply the things it's telling you to do on paper? How do you write those things down? It does need to be documented. And the second thing that I just want to point out that sometimes comes as a surprise is that the management system itself is about 50% of the total external audit. So if you go to get certified, it's not all about the controls that you'll need to provide evidence for. In this case, there's 38 controls. About half the total audit is auditing this management system. So you need to take it very seriously when it comes to implementing any certification scheme when it's ISO, uh, ISO based, especially ISO 42001. So let me walk you through those clauses four through 10. So you have a little bit better idea of how this thing is structured and how it's set up. So first of all, uh, first good question is, why does it four through 10? Why, why is it one through 10? So for ISO frameworks in any management system, clauses one through three, or you could just think of them as admin. They're typically normative references, other administrative uh, jargon, uh, and you don't really need to think about it. There's nothing for you to do. There's nothing for you to document. So you need to start on clause four. So you'll hear it called clause four through 10 is the management system. So let me talk you through that one by one. So how do you establish a governance structure? How do you build out a management system? Clause four, it starts you off with context of the organization. So the types of things that you would want to document when it comes to documenting the context is what is leadership's responsibility? Who are the internal stakeholders that might be impacted by this management system? Like your CTO, your product team, who else internally, legal, might be impacted? You would want to define external stakeholders. So things like maybe your customers care, maybe regulators care. You'd want to start thinking about what is the scope of this management system? Are you trying to certify a specific product because you're, gener you're, you're building something unique and selling that to customers? Are you trying to certify something like an integration with open AI? So what, what are you even getting certified? What does this management system manage inside of your company? Because that context will greatly impact how you manage that risk. So clause four requires you to think through and document that stuff. Then you get into clause five. Clause five is leadership. And an important concept to know for ISO is that they really think everything starts with leadership. It's a top-down approach, not a bottom-up approach. So leadership has to commit to providing the resources, has to prevent to paying attention, has to commit to continuous improvement. They need to state their expectations and policy. They need to define roles and responsibilities. So there's an outline of the expectations of leadership. That is an important concept because often compliance is, is delegated to an analyst or some junior employee at a company, and they kind of have to drag the company across the finish line to obtain certification. And then they're unpleasantly surprised to learn when they get audited that the auditor finds out, hey, look, top-level management isn't even involved in this program. It's really not even a management system. And you have what's called a non-conformity on your audit, and everybody's really unhappy about this. But the upside of that is, is if you are trying to help your organization obtain certification, this gives you the permission and the power to go to your top level management and say, hey, I need you involved in this. It's important that you bless this and that you help us think through the risk and that you buy in and that you invest in this program. And that's what Clause 5 is all about. So then, so you have context, you got leadership's buy-in. The next thing you need to do is think about planning. And 
some of the things that ISO encourages you to think about when it comes to planning is uh, thinking about your risk. Do you know your unique risk when it comes to your AI management system? Have you done a risk assessment? Your risk will be very different if you're developing an AI product and selling it versus if you're integrating with OpenAI. Your risk will be very different if you are automating decision making like the outcome of a loan versus you're just creating a customer support chat box. So you need to document those risks, think about how you're going to treat those risks, and then come up with a strategy unique to your organization as related to your management system based on the documented risk. And that's that's what planning is all about. Your risk will dictate the plan, and that follows right into Clause 7, which is your support. And Clause 7 is about giving the program the right resources and the right attention based on the risk that you've uncovered. So things that uh, they would expect to see in the support section would be things like, do you have a documented resource plan? Do you have documented budget? Do you have uh, the right human resources applied to the project? So is this something that like no one even works on the management system? Or do you have full-time employees completely dedicated to it? Do you have engineers and other stakeholders who part of their time is to manage this program? So based on your risk, do you have the right resources applied to the program and can you justify that decision? So that's a way to think about support. It's really the resources that you're applying to the, to the plan. And that follows you into operation. So operation is uh, largely references back in the standard to clause six planning. So operation references your risk assessment, your risk treatment plan, and how you're going to manage risk. So in some ways, duplicative of six. Clause nine is about performance evaluation. So if you think about this whole management system, you've done, you've defined the context, you know your scope, you know who's impacted, leadership's committed, you have a plan, you've identified your risk, you've applied the resources, great. But how do you know if your management system's performing? Because things change over time. How do you know if there's new risk? How do you know if controls are operating? How does the management team steer the ship? So that's clause nine performance evaluation. It includes a couple things. So uh, one thing that it requires is an independent internal audit. That's a, that's a service Risk 360 often performs for clients is we'll come in and we'll do an internal audit of the program and report to management the results of their program so that management can steer the ship. They say, hey, my program's running really well or my program has some significant gaps and risk. I need to address those risks. And that is your internal audit. And then that's clause 9.2 specifically. But there's also clause 9.3 that requires management to ingest those findings and then decide what they're going to do about them. So that's a, an ecosystem that is required in clause 9. And then you get into clause 10. So to repeat it all back to you, because this thing kind of ties together, you've established your context, leadership is committed, you have your plan, you've given the resources, you're now operating the plan. You have a performance evaluation process where you're getting impact uh, inputs. You're understanding where areas for improvement. And now that you have that performance evaluation, clause 10 is management's commitment to improve the program. So you're going to do something about all those risks. You're going to do something about the results of your internal audit. You're going to do something about the evolving landscape in the world that's changing how AI is impacting your program. And you're going to continuously improve. And that shapes the overall governance of your management system. And just remember, that management system has to be documented. It's usually a, a document in of itself. And then you have to be able to prove that you're actually acting on that document to your external auditor. And we'll talk about the external audit a little later. But this is a huge work stream. There's a lot of organizational change involved when it comes to implementing a management system. And this is where a lot of the big thinking happens when it comes to putting a program in place. So that is an AI management system. I hope that's helpful. Next up, we're going to talk about the 38 controls and objectives related to the uh, AI certification and give you a little bit of clarity on what that looks like. So I'll see you at the next one. Mm -hmm.